Thank you for joining us today. We are excited to talk with Arthur, author Mark Huffman. Please post any questions you have for him in the chat and we'll get to them at the end of the program. Mark Huffman is an anesthesiologist by day and by night a children's book author. He writes about shared human experiences, which in the toot fairy means that he writes about toots, bottoms, and careers. According to Huffman, he prepared for writing children's books by spending much of his early life as an actual child. His debut book, to The Toot Fairy, is, is The Toot Fairy, and he is also the author of Leviathan, an adult sci-fi fiction series that debuted, debuted in 2020. He lives with his family in Texas. So welcome, Mark. We're excited to have you. I'm going to turn it over to you to read your books, and then we'll get back. Uh, I'll come back. Do you want to start with the Toot Fairy or the Cheesemaker? Start with the Toot Fairy. Toot Fairy. All right. So let me get that one up. How was that? That looks good. All right. Can we scroll? We can scroll. Cheesemaker Durdsden, also illustrated by Don Davidson, also written by me. Here we go. There once was a cheesemaker, Durdsden by name, who made bland, boring cheese that all tasted the same. It was rubbery, not creamy, mundane, not piquant. Truth be told, it was cheese that nobody would want. Durdsden's cheese sales were poor. His competitors laughed, but he didn't abandon the cheesemaking craft. I shall travel the world learning secrets of cheese. If I have to, I'll crawl on my hands and my knees. I'll become a cheese master. And then I'll return to make mind-blowing cheese with the methods I'll learn. And with that, Durdsden left with his clothes in a sack. Many townspeople thought that he'd never come back. In the market one day, he was suddenly there with a platter of cheese and a confident air. I assure you, my friends, that my time wasn't wasted. This cheese is the best that you'll ever have tasted. The first man was doubtful. He took a small bite. Then he said in amazement, hey, Durdsden, you're right. In a flash, all the cheese from the platter was gone. So we opened a shop, the line stretched on and on. Every cheese in the store was bought up in a minute. Folks ate it right there, never asking what's in it. Instead, they gave Durdston a round of applause as they stuffed the last morsels of cheese in their jaws. Mr. D, you're astounding. We're so glad to know you. So how have you done it? Said Durdston, I'll show you. He opened the storeroom, a cheesy Nirvana. Set in the back wall was a door to a sauna, and there on a bench in the sweltering heat sat a huge hairy beast who was soaking his feet. Its unkempt dripping fur was conspicuously sweaty. It's Bigfoot, said Durdston. Well, technically Yeti. By chance, I encountered this very rare creature whose name is derived from its prominent feature. I brought it back home. Now it helps me create this exquisite fromage you've all proven tastes great. Hey, Big F, here's some people I want you to meet. How about showing them tootsies? Let's see those huge feet. The beast lifted his foot. It was truly immense from a tub of white liquid like cream, but more dense. What is that? Asked the lass, sounding slightly afraid. That, dear girl, is the place where my cheeses are made. I add to the milk base profuse perspiration. The salt makes my cheese such a tasty sensation. I'll let everyone look at that for a second. It gets its green marbling from natural fungus that lives near the nails of those feet so humongous. I carefully scrape all the curds off his toes. That's the spot you can see where the thickest cheese grows. Then I put it in bags, then the bags in large socks. Bigfoot squishes the whey from the curds as he walks. Once it's thusly prepared, then I cut it in wheels and the rind is organic. It's crust from his heels. A stunned sort of silence fell over the crowd. Durdsden feared his eccentric techniques weren't allowed. Then as one, all the townspeople started to clap. Durdsden's cheese will put this little town on the map. And that's just what occurred. It was a source of great pride. People flocked to that cheese, both from far and from wide. They would sample the cheese and invariably buy it. Some asked how he made it, but Durdsden stayed quiet. They'd wonder at times, this is cheese as they chewed, are you thinking of branching to different food? As a matter of fact, Durdsden answered, I am. I've been working quite hard on a new kind of jam. The end. Liked that. 
All right, we should be ready to do the other one now. Seems to work better like this. <laughs> so that's what we're gonna go with. <laughs> All right. I'm ready when you are. Oh, gosh. Yep, this is the tube fairy. Let's read it. In fairyland, fairies can choose what to do. They can go to the fountain where wishes come true. They can toss in a coin and declare occupation by saying a word that describes their vocation. Some fairies say rainbow to shine after showers. Some fairies say garden to live among flowers. Some fairies say moonlight. Some fairies say dreams. Some fairies say sugar plums. Some say ice cream. If you ask little Jessa, she'd tell you the truth. From the time she was young, she had planned to say tooth. What a wonderful thing for a fairy to do, to collect all the teeth that small children outgrew. How delighted they'd be when they found in their beds coins for each little chomper that fell from their heads. The day finally arrived, little Jess was excited to start the career upon which she decided. She stepped to the fountain and threw in a coin and got ready to speak out the job she would join. But when that moment came to say what she would be, she pronounced to her horror the T-H is T. Toot. She had clearly said toot. Everybody had heard. All her plans went kaput with one misspoken word in a cloud of green fog, a strange fairy appeared. He had long golden robes and a wispy white beard. My name's Poopums the Pungent, he said with a bow. You'll be working with me in a job that starts now. This is one of our more, um, forgotten careers. There's not been a toot fairy for hundreds of years. I'm the last of my kind and I've long since retired. So it goes without saying, you're certainly hired. I shall teach you a trade that's both science and art. It's a difficult thing to detect every fart. They're invisible, mind you, escaping unseen from the tiniest babe. From the world's greatest queen, it's the smell, don't you know, that'll give them away. They might smell like old beef. They might smell like wet hay. Every person around you is tooting like nuts, shooting gross smelling gases from out of their butts, whether silent but deadly or shockingly loud. Every toot disappears for it's just a brief cloud. So you've got to be nimble, you've got to be quick because toots don't last long, but they're coming out thick. Why, statistically speaking, there's billions a day. So you see why this job is all work and no play. For it's your task, young fairy, to find every one. It's not glamorous work, but it needs to be done. Here, these magical goggles can help you to tell. Also, sometimes there's noise, plus a terrible smell. Jessa said, I like teeth, in a sad, quiet voice, but I'll try very hard, though it's not my first choice. Poopum stopped. He could see that poor Jess was in pain. So he stroked his white beard and he tried to explain. I was once much like you in the days of my youth. When I spoke out my wish, I too meant to stay tooth. I was happy to find that the same pleasure comes when you're working with bottoms or working with gums. You see, humans release things of different kinds from the bones of their jaws or from out their behinds. And a tooth's like a tooth, for they both possess mass, except but one's made of dentin, the other of gas. Both are one of a kind, custom order, handmade. And when kids push them out, they deserve to get paid. So we take out our coin, whether quarter or diamond, we wait for the tooth, then at just the right time, when we feel the explosions come out their back doors, put the coin in their pants, stuff it right down the drawers. To her credit, sweet Jessa was barely dejected, though twasn't the work she had ever expected. Instead, she was filled with a strong sense of duty. She'd find every toot, she would sniff every booty. And that's what she did and she'll do it for years, trading cash for the vapors expelled from our rears. If there's change in your pants after tooting, don't fear, it's just Jess, hard at work, making quarters appear. The end. All right. Let me turn back on my camera. So, um, uh, let me start by talk about how you decided that you wanted to be an author. Well, that didn't start with children's books, and it was kind of by accident. It was, uh, as you mentioned, I'm a, I'm a doctor, and the first year of being a real doctor is called your internship, and that involves being at the hospital all night one or two days a week, hoping not to do anything, but doing a lot of stuff all night. 
sometimes get into the call room. And there was one night on call, it was about 2.30 and I couldn't sleep because you really can't very well. And I thought to myself, for some reason, I, I am just gonna start writing a book. Let's just do it. Let's see if, I don't know. I can't even tell you why. And then a few years later, I had written a, an entire 450 page novel, which is the novel that you mentioned. Um, so that was fun. I didn't think I could do that. And then a few years ago, um, I have four kids and we were driving to Florida for vacation. It was my wife's turn to drive. And I, for some reason, got it into my head that we were all a little bored. I was gonna write something to entertain him. And how hard could it be to write a poem about the toot fairy, which just somehow got in my head and I thought it was very funny. Uh, and then by the time we got to Alabama, it was done and they loved it. And then I just kept writing them. They just, ideas kept popping into my head and here we are. And my third book is coming out in, uh, in the fall. So talk about how the difference between writing a 400 page novel and writing a picture book. <laughs> the big difference is time. It takes a long time just to put down all the words and then to go back and edit the words. And if, if at any point you get your, your progress checked or you're doing something else, or you, you take a break for a while, you gotta read the whole thing and remember what everyone was doing. There's just a lot that goes into writing a big novel, but uh, a children's book, you, you have to cram it in. It's not, it's not as simple as you might think. It's shorter, which means it can go faster, but that's a lot of cramming in all the story elements in 32 pages. Um, but I would say time. I've written a lot of my books, uh, a lot of my children's books in a, in a day or two. And then the, they're out and they're in the world. So. And do you find that poetry comes easily to you? Because picture books tend to be mostly poetry. Yes. And I didn't know that. Um, I mean, my, my school and training was obviously science, 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 science. And it turns out I can throw some rhymes together pretty, uh, pretty good, pretty all right, which is fun. And it's been fun, but it definitely is, I would say, God-given ability because it's not something that I ever worked on. Um, talk about working with an illustrator. So Don is in Florida and it's definitely a collaboration. I actually drew before I wrote. I did some concept art and some illustration in, in like medical school. Um, but the process of illustrating a children's book is very technical, uh, more so than you would think, uh, because I, I think a lot of us look at a children's book and say, oh, I could, I could do that. That's so simple. And that's maybe not, maybe not as true as you think it is. Um, but she is, she is great. She's fast. It, like I said, it's very collaborative. Um, she came up with a lot of the designs. I, sometimes I throw stuff back, but she has been, and this is not always true either, but she has been delightful to work with. And I think we've done some good books already and hopefully we can do a lot more. Um, but she's, she, has been, she has been a pleasure to work with. Yeah, I know a lot of picture book artists, um, a lot of times they never even have conversations with mm -hmm. the illustrators. They submit their stuff and some ideas and then kind of through an intermediary, um, yes. things go, go back and forth. So it's nice that you actually have um, a collaborative uh, yes. relationship That's with her. Right. And that is something that I specifically wanted. Um, I wanted to be with a publisher who would allow me to kind of talk with her and we could work out designs and it wouldn't just be, here are the words and then they get the pictures and show me. Um, no, not that there's anything bad about that, but I, I think the whole thing has been much more enjoyable for me with a background in art um, to be able to see my little handprints in there. Um, and I think I almost think it goes faster and it's 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 been fun. It's been good. <coughs> Excuse me. Sorry. Um, uh, so. Can you talk about what you're working on now? Oh my goodness. Well, I can talk about the book that's coming out. Okay. Uh, 
and it's done. It's going to be released on September the 7th, I think is the current release date. Um, it's called Bill and the Bard. And it is the most irritating thing I've ever written. I wrote it for a gag. I got the idea that I would just write a whole poem like this, a whole children's book. Um, but then I changed the last word so it doesn't rhyme. And I thought it would just drive my publisher crazy because uh, it drove me crazy. I did the whole thing. Um, it, I, I think it starts in a land far away. There was once a young bard with a problem. He found rhyming words to be difficult. He was skilled on the fiddle, the flute and guitar and his voice was beloved by crowds near and distant. But when writing a poem or sonnet or song, when he tried to make rhymes, that last word came out not quite right exactly. And so on. And it's just the worst thing. And everything gets better. It's fixed. But I, I sent it to him thinking that he'd get a chuckle out of it. Um, and he said, can we, let's just make this a book. This is great. So I, I, I think it's going to, there's some pretty good hooks and, and tricks and it's a little interactive, but that's kind of what's coming up next. And we're pretty excited about that. But I got a poem about a mermaid that's uh, that we're talking about starting. Uh, mermaids are very big. Mermaids are very big. This, <laughs> this, book be called, this book is called Bubbles. I'll let you think about why a book about mermaids might be called Bubbles after you know, from the author of the Toot Fairy. Uh, <laughs> but if if this thing can keep going, I've mermaid poems and troll poems and earwax poems and a Bigfoot sequel um, that's also a Toot Fairy sequel. It's called Big Toot. Lots of things, lots of things, all kind of a theme, but um, no, children's books are great. And I'm still working on the third book in my, in my big adult series too. But, you know, like I said, that takes, it takes a lot of sitting down and write. But it's so what is your, what is your writing style? Are you, I, I, you know, particularly more with the bigger books, are, are you a, a big plotter or do you just plotter kind of write as things come with, to you? Right. So plotter versus pantser. Yep. Um, I would say I'm a hybrid. Uh, so my, my adult books, especially this last one, it's, it's kind of biblical fiction. So the third one and really the series culminates in the, in the flood of Genesis. So the ending was already kind of written for me. So that's kind of, in a way that's nice. I know where everyone's getting to, but in between you have to fill it with things that happen that are interesting and make sense according to the text. So I've got a structure of a plot, but beyond that, I, I don't do super detailed outlines. Um, I, I've always thought it sounded a little pretentious when authors say, well, the, the characters speak to me and they tell me what they wanna do. <laughs> um, but I found that there's actually a little bit of truth to that. Like you'll be writing, you won't have any particular plans and then it'll just be, this guy would totally do this. Huh, yeah, I guess that makes sense. So it's a, it's a funny sort of, it's a funny sort of experience writing books. Sometimes it's very unexpected, which look, you're the one doing it, you're in control. You wouldn't think there would be any, anything unexpected, but sometimes things just click in your brain that you didn't see coming. So your day job, you're, you're a doctor. Um, so do you think you'll continue to do both? Or do you think at some point you'll do the author gig as a full-time thing? People have asked me that. And I don't, I don't know that be, the author thing takes enough time for me to ever give up medicine. And I've spent so much time learning how to be good at my job because you don't, you don't really get to keep doing the, the job I have if you're not, you know, if you're not good at it. Um, I would never give that up. But, you know, I would love to get to a point where I could do, I could go to Africa and do two months of missions um, with someone who's never seen an anesthesiologist, because there are all sorts of places like that. There are mission opportunities and kind of nonprofits things here that, you know, it would, it would be cool to be able to uh, put my medical skills towards that maybe being an author would give me the freedom to do. So the answer, no, I plan on doing both. I mean, so far, so good. Well, you know, most authors have what they call a day job anyway. I mean, most people don't, don't give that up. 
So very few, um, very few are able to, which is not something that you think, you think oh, you, you have a book published. How is, how is your mansion? <laughs> it's never how it works. <laughs> Um, uh, even even when you have a runaway bestseller, particularly the first book, that's never how it works. Right, exactly. <laughs> um, so do you have any writing advice for uh, wannabe authors? The biggest piece of advice, uh, and understand this is coming from someone who had no training and no literary education whatsoever, kind of just stumbled into it and you know he's plugging along as best he can but the biggest thing that i would say is don't write for any reason then you want to make a book like, don't do it for money don't write to the market don't have this dream of of any sort of publishing literary glory you just have to want to write the book and the great thing about doing it now is that the worst case scenario if you do it you self-publish and there's no stigma you can put on Amazon. Some people are trying to do that. Some people are trying to get back their the rights to all their old stuff so they can so they can self publish. Um, but if you want to write a book, do it because you want it to exist, not for any other reason. Which is honestly the same same advice I give someone who wants to be a doctor. You better want to be a doctor. Don't don't do it because I. Uh, authors or doctors make money or authors or doctors, um, you know, enjoy some sort of respect from saying, I'm an author, I'm a published author. Forget all that stuff. You gotta have a story. And if you do, you put it out there for you and you do the one you want. I and love that. I think that's actually excellent advice. It's very um, good you, when you have a book that you wrote yourself. So if we have any questions, you can definitely post them in the chat. Um, so obviously a lot of your books are about stinky stuff. Why do you think kids like stinky stuff? There's just something hilarious about Toots in particular, but all, all of that, I mean, toe cheese and earwax and boogers, uh, I don't know. But I also think it's hilarious. <laughs> That's what I go by. But there's just something I, I don't know that it it doesn't particularly cross any sort of super naughty lines, but it's still kind of like tee hee hee. This is this is a little a little bad. Um, so I I don't know. But they are they're funny they're hilarious. Yeah. Um, what do your kids think about you being? A published author now so at first they thought and they've been in this process for for way longer than it takes to to get a book so they thought the toot fairy i think this is fair to say i've never heard anyone laugh as hard as they did in the car when i read them the poem uh and then that's that's been true for you know when i read it to their cousins and in-laws and uh, people tend to think it's hilarious and they did, and then I kept doing more and they thought they were funny and then I kept doing more and now they're like, I mean, it's okay. It's okay, daddy, it's fine. This is hilarious. This is about a, a cowboy with a whole herd of tooting cows and then he eats beans and there's toots everywhere. Yeah, it's, it's fine. So I think I've raised this, the kind of their, their expectations to the point where they're just like, yeah, it's good. Well, I, I did write one recently that that impressed them. It's not it's not a body humor one, but it's it's a, a sequel to the one that's coming out in the fall, and it involves anagrams and it's very complicated. And I still kind of can't believe I pulled it off, but I think I pulled it off. And that one they were kind of like, okay, that's that's pretty good. So they're but hard to impress now. They're hard to impress. I've made them hard. <laughs> Which I, think, yeah. I, I think a lot of a lot of parents get to that point, right? Where even even like famous parents and their kids are like, eh. Yeah, who cares? <laughs> you, you, you start in a movie, that's what you do, Dad. I so what? Yeah, whatever. It doesn't matter. So that's where I am. <laughs> so is there anything that you would have liked me to ask that I didn't ask? Hmm. I don't think so. Those are good questions. 
All right. Well, I think we don't have any audience questions. I think we might be good for the day. Okay. Um, any last words? Um, if for anyone watching at home, there is, well, I guess one last word is if you like those books, it would be lovely if you got on Amazon or Barnes and Noble or wherever and ordered them for yourself or even got on your social media or however you communicate with your friends with kids and say, hey, these books were pretty good. These were funny. I think you'd like them because that means I keep, I get to keep making more books and I like to keep making more books. Um, but otherwise, this was this was great. Thanks for giving me the opportunity. COVID's been the, the whole virus. It's it's been a for someone who wrote a bunch of books that are kind of designed to be read out loud to an audience of children. This is not the best time. Yeah, it's been it's been definitely challenging. Yes, but you know, being able to do some stuff virtually has certainly uh, made that Big that time. easier. Definitely. Well. And I will say that your appeal for people to purchase their books is a perfect segue into, you can purchase copies of Mark's books at Monkey and Dog. Uh, yeah, Monkey yeah. and Dog is our local independent children's bookstore here in Fort Worth. Um, this is their contact information. Um, we did record this presentation and we will be putting it on our YouTube page in the next week or so. Be sure to subscribe to our channel for more great content from the Fort Worth Public Library and turn on those notifications. And we have a couple of more um, upcoming uh, children's picture book author visits. So check out our website, fortworthlibrary.org for more information. And thank you for coming today. And Mark, thank you for your time today. We really appreciated it. Thank you so much. That was great. All right, have a great day. Bye. Bye-bye.